Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem out of boundary paths. We're given an M by N grid with a ball at some starting location, which is given to us. We're allowed to move the ball in any of the four directions and we want to basically count the number of paths that we can take the ball and move it out of bounds. The catch here is that we are given a number of maximum moves. So it's not like it can go forever because theoretically, if we weren't given this, the answer would be infinity. If you're wondering why, it's because the ball could go back and forth between two cells and then go out of bounds. And the next time it can go back and forth uh, two times and then out of bounds. And the next it can go back and forth like three times, et cetera, et cetera. To avoid that, they give us this parameter and the answer could be really, really large. So we want to mod it by this prime number. Okay, so the first thing to think about is it looks like a graph problem. Maybe some kind of traversal like depth for search is gonna work for us because this time we are enumerating all of the paths. Like we want individual paths and then we wanna be able to accumulate them. BFS probably isn't gonna be helpful for that. Knowing that, let's just kind of go through it trying this brute force approach. So let's just use this example. We're given two rows, two columns, and two max moves. So initially we start at zero, zero. That's our starting coordinate for this particular uh, example, but it could be different uh, depending on like other examples. So here we kind of have four choices, don't we? We can move to the left over here. That would be taking the column and making it negative one. That looks out of bounds to me. So this is actually a base case. They don't really make it clear in the problem description, which I think is kind of annoying. But in the second example, if you scroll down, you'll see that once you go out of bounds, you're not allowed to come back in bounds. So that just counts as like one path and then we're done with it. Other case, we go down, which would be making the row one. So like down here, row is one, column stays zero. So in that case, we're still in bounds. And over here, we could move to the right. That would be uh, taking the column and setting it to one and the row stays the same. And lastly, we could move up, which would mean setting the row to negative one and the column stays the same. So two base cases here, they both return one. And I'll kind of just tell you that from here, this is one zero, which is this position down here. Again, we have four choices. We can go out of bounds here, out of bounds down there. Those are gonna be two solutions for us, two valid solutions. And then the other two would be going to the right and going up above. And those would be cases where we do not reach the result. So let's enumerate those. I'll kind of just color code them. Let's say these two are the ones where we go out of bounds and these two, we don't go out of bounds. Now I haven't shown it, but not only are we gonna be keeping track of the current row and the current column, obviously, but we also wanna keep track of how many moves we have left. Initially, we started with two. At this level of the tree, we have one move remaining. At this level of the tree, we have zero moves remaining. So these two are actually also base cases. The only difference is from here, we would return zero because we weren't out of bounds. Along this path, we were not able to go out of bounds, but along this path we were, along these paths we were, along this path we were, and I'll just tell you that from here, zero, one, which is this spot over here, there's gonna be two paths where we go out of bounds and two paths where we stay in bounds. If you total all of those up, we're gonna end up with a result of six. So this brute force approach works. And if you notice, we have three variables we're keeping track of, the current row, the current column, and the number of moves remaining. This is not gonna be very efficient because this tree, like the height of it is gonna be the number of moves and we are branching four times. So I think it's gonna be like something like four to the power of how many moves we have. So exponential, can we make it better? Well, the fact that we only have this many variables means we can apply dynamic programming to this, AKA caching. So basically we don't want to repeat any work. If we land on a particular cell with the same number of moves, like we might land on this cell with two moves remaining. There might be a different path that takes us to the same cell again with two moves remaining. We don't need to then count how many paths from there we can go out of bounds because we will have stored that in the cache. So knowing that, let's code it up. What is the time complexity gonna be though? That depends on the variables, right? 
So R times C, let's say this is like the dimensions in this problem, it's M by N. So I will go ahead and use that M by N times the max number of moves, which I'll just say uh, max moves. So this is the big O N time complexity and the size of our cache is gonna be the same. So you can see this is a three dimensional dynamic programming problem. Haven't done one of these in a while. Now let's code it up. So first thing I'm gonna do is create that mod constant and I'm gonna assign M and N to these just to make them a bit more readable. That's just kind of my style, but you don't have to do that if you don't want to. Then we'll start with the depth first search. We're gonna pass in row, column, and the number of moves that we have remaining. Let's start with the base cases. The main one is if we went out of bounds. Is row less than zero? Or is the row uh, equal to the number of rows? Or is column less than zero? Or is the column equal to the number of columns? That would mean it's too great. In any of those cases, we return one. We found a path that leads out of bounds and then we can stop. The other base case, if we ran out of moves, we didn't go out of bounds and we ran out of moves, moves is equal to zero, what do we do then? Well, we couldn't find any path, return zero. Next, we have the recursive case. It's basically gonna be DFS four times. So it's gonna be like this, row plus one, and the column stays the same, and the moves, what's gonna happen to them? Well, we're making a move right now, so we should probably decrement this by one. And so we're gonna do this four times. We're gonna take this and add it, and this time we'll go the opposite direction, row minus one. Once we add all four of them, in Python, you can get away with modding the result, and that will work. You can do that, but in many languages, that don't have integers that can grow arbitrarily large. Like in Python, the number can just keep growing. It's not gonna overflow. But in some languages, it might. So the best way to handle that would be anytime you are performing an addition, there's the possibility that this could overflow. So anytime you have an addition, go ahead and take that result and make sure that you mod it. So let's do this. And I'm going to do pretty much the exact same thing down here with the column changing. So row this time will stay the same, column will be incremented by one and decremented by one. There's one more addition actually, we're adding these two together, we're adding these two together, and then we wanna add both of these terms together. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and add a plus. This plus applies to adding this with this. So since we're adding those together, we do need the mod down here. So this is the brute force approach. We'll call DFS down here, starting from the start row that is provided to us and the start column that is provided to us and the number of max moves that are provided to us. So again, while this approach works, it's not super efficient. Let's change that. Let's add a cache up here. I like to use a hash map, so it makes it pretty easy for us. So up here, I have that hash map. Let's go ahead and add a base case. There's two steps, one is the base case. So if this has already been seen before, if this tuple is already in the cache, just return the result that the cache has stored for us. If that's not the case, then let's compute it. But before we return, let's make sure that we actually add it to the cache, just like this. And then we can return it. So now let's run this to make sure that it works. And as you can see on the left, yes, it does. There is one optimization that we can actually make. You may know that there is like the caching version of dynamic programming. There's also the bottom up solution. Sometimes with the bottom up solution, we can optimize the space. And in this case, that is possible. Let me show you how we can do that. Solving this problem without recursion requires creating memory. We will need extra memory. So what we're gonna do is basically create a grid of the same size as this. And the first such grid is gonna apply when we have, let's say, M equals zero moves remaining. And we'll create another grid that applies when we have one move remaining, et cetera, et cetera until we have like M equals the max number of moves. Suppose we have that, suppose we have M equals the max number of moves. What is one of these cells going to represent? This cell is gonna represent the number stored here, tells us the number of paths that from here with this many moves remaining can possibly reach out of bounds. So it's not that much different than the depth first search cache. This is very similar to that. 
So that's what this grid will tell us. Now, how do we then compute that value in here? Well, we're going to have another grid. We're going to have a grid that has all the values populated where the number of max moves is actually minus one. Why is that the case? Because from here, we want to basically count how many possible ways we can get out of bounds with this many moves left. Like that's what we're trying to compute here. And in order for us to do that, we are going to add the result of the four directions, the result of the four sub problems, or you could think of it as the recursive calls, right? We have a couple base cases. That's not a big deal. We have a out of bounds here, out of bounds here. With those, we'll add the plus one that we did kind of like in the recursive solution. So pretty simple there, right? Not a huge thing. But what about the other cases? What about when we go left? What about when we go down? Well, that would tell us how many ways we can go out of bounds from here if we had one less move remaining. And good thing that we have that computed down here, right? So this is called the bottom up approach, the bottom up dynamic programming solution. You can kind of understand why, because instead of starting with M equals max, we're starting with M equals zero and then working our way up to the solution. Now, if we're going to have this many grids in memory, if we're going to have a grid like this many times the for the number of max moves, that's not going to save us space, is it? That would be the same as the recursive solution, the same memory complexity. But if you're clever, you notice that if we want to compute one grid, we only need the previous grid in memory. We don't need all possible grids. And I wish I could visualize this a little bit better, but this is kind of the nature of 3D dynamic programming. It's kind of hard to do that, but you can imagine that we have a grid for every single M. What we're going to do is only keep two grids in memory at a time. So if this, let's say M is equal to five, we're going to have M equals four also in memory. Once we've computed M equals five, then we want to now compute M equals six. So then we're going to take this grid and then move it into the other grid. So then this will be M equals five and we'll kind of go like this. So this will allow us to solve the problem, keeping only two grids in memory at a time. So therefore the memory complexity is going to be M by N. Now let's code this up. So what I'm going to do is create one such copy of the grid. And this one is just going to be filled with all zeros. We want how many rows we want a row for the number of rows that we are given. And how big do we want each row to be? Well, we want it to have how many values are in basically the number of columns that we have. Now we want to work our way up. By the way, this original one is let's say for M equals zero. This is how many ways we can go out of bounds if we have zero moves, because that just makes sense. It's going to be zero for all of them. Next, let's compute for M in range from one all the way up until I think uh, max move. Actually plus one here because we want to end on the max move. Next, let's create another two dimensional array. And I'm just going to copy and paste from up above. I'm going to call this temp. This is the current grid that we're computing. This is the paths for this many moves remaining. Now let's iterate over the grid and compute each value. So for R in range of rows and for column in range columns. We are trying to compute the value that's going to go here in temp at RC. How many ways can we go out of bounds to do that? What we would do is basically add up all the ways in the four adjacent directions, kind of like I did in the recursive solution. So like you might try to do it that way, like row plus one and at the same column and then plus all of the other four. It's technically possible to do it that way. But if you notice what happens if we go out of bounds, because it's not like we have buffer room in our grid, we could have allocated some buffer, but that would make the computation a bit more complicated, like how we handle the way that we index this grid. And when I say buffer, I basically mean adding dimensions to this so that like we never go out of bounds. That is a valid way to do it, but it's really annoying to code up. Instead, we're going to handle the out of bounds error a little bit differently. We're going to handle it with some conditions. So instead of executing all four of those like additions, like summing up all four of them at the same time, we're going to do it one by one because it's possible that row plus one could go out of bounds. It's possible that row minus one could go out of bounds, etc. 
So let's handle that. Let's check if row plus one is out of bounds, meaning it's equal to the number of rows, we'll handle that differently than if we are actually in bounds. So if we're in bounds, that's pretty simple. What we're going to do here is add these two guys together and go ahead and mod it by whatever that mod number we have is. And so this is great. This is beautiful. What about this case where we went out of bounds? Well, that's actually a bit more simple. I'm going to copy this because instead of adding this, we're just going to add one. It's very simple. We went out of bounds. We found a path add one. This handles the case where we go in this direction. That's why you can see R plus one here. Let's handle all the other three cases. I'm going to do that just by copy and pasting this a couple times. So first, let's go here. Row minus one. We'll be adding one here. And here we're going to change this to row minus one. Now let's handle the column cases. So here, let's copy uh, this actually here if row minus one is equal to zero that's when we know we've gone out of bounds that's very important so i don't want to miss that now let's copy paste and so here this is going to be the case let's say where we do column plus one is equal to the number of columns and in that case we go out of bounds we add one if we stay in bounds we will just go to the grid at column plus one over here and same thing down here. Let's change this column minus one. We'll add one in that case. Otherwise, we will compute the sub problem at column minus one and then add that. I know this doesn't look super clean. I guess if you wanted to, you don't have to write them as if else statements. You could write four if statements up above and then four if statements uh, below that. But this is a valid way to do it. Once we've gone through that, we want to go ahead and update our grid. So we'll assign it to what temp happens to be after that. So grid is going to be equal to temp. And then on the next iteration of the loop, we allocate a new temp array, do the same thing all over again until we are done. Once we're done, what do we return out here? Well, we 100% know that this solution can't possibly be correct right now because look, we haven't even used these two variables yet. How could we solve the problem without using those variables? To correct that, let's return the solution in the grid at those coordinates. So at the starting row and the starting column, because this tells us how many paths from here can go out of bounds. By the time we've gone through this like entire for loop, the grid will tell us that for this many moves. So let's run this to make sure that it works. Okay, actually I had a bug, very sorry about that. So in this case, if we wanna know if the row went out of bounds, we don't check that it's equal to zero. We check that it's less than zero. Same thing down here with the column. We don't check it's equal to zero. We check it's less than zero. Again, really sorry about that. But that is, I think, a minor point. The rest of the logic is correct. And as you can see on the left, this solution works. It's pretty efficient, but sometimes the run times on leak code can be random. It is more memory efficient than the previous solution, though. Thanks for watching. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. And I'll see you soon.